A relationship with the right referral partner could be a game changer for any B2B company. So what if you could reverse engineer these relationships at a moment's notice? Start a podcast. Invite potential referral partners to be guests on your show. And grow your referral network faster than ever. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to the B2B Growth Show, a podcast dedicated to helping B2B executives achieve explosive growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. I'm James Carberry. And I'm Jonathan Green. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. Today we are joined by April Meyer. April is the Marketing Director at Thomson Reuters. April, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, we were we were sort of um, jamming a little bit offline, back and forth about what we were going to be talking about on the show. And I am really excited where we kind of landed, talking about this idea of re-engaging decision makers when they go dark. And I think it is a common occurrence where you have been able to open the door to these decision makers, whether it's through your, uh, your, your content marketing, whether it's through your ABM efforts. And you of course are an ABM expert. Um, so you've gotten that chance to open a door, but then for one reason or another, whatever happens, they, they, they fall back out of the pipeline. They go dark. What do you do at that point? And I'm excited to talk about this today, but before we get into today's topic, uh, maybe you can tell our listeners what you and your team are up to these days. Sure, absolutely. So I've worked for Thomson Reuters for about six years now, and the team that I'm running is actually a newly created team um, in the year 2017. Uh, I have a small team, and the target market uh, that we are going after are large and mid-sized law firms. So we're working with a very limited universe of about 1,400 accounts. Uh, Within those accounts, there can be anywhere from thousands of prospects per account um, all the way down to maybe just one or two key decision makers that we need to get in touch with. So um, one of the the big things that we say um, within our space is that generally – For each account, we only have about one shot per year. And with our limited universe, we it's sort of a a make or break situation for us. We either get the deal done that year or we have to find a new and totally different direction to take that next year. Yeah. And and so this is perfect because like you said, with this with this very limited account pool to draw from, this is an issue that I mean really is is near and dear to you. You know, you you only have so many people that you can connect with. So you have to re-engage these decision makers if they've kind of dropped off the radar, if they've if they've stopped responding, or or for whatever reason. So you have you've kind of honed this process. So I'm I'm really excited to have you on the show and talk about this. You had kind of mentioned that you've you've reached them, the door has been opened. What do you do now? Tell us tell us what you do from there, April. Sure, absolutely. So there's a lot of noise in the market, of course. Uh, the the decision makers and the influencers that we um, in our ABM programming are looking to get in touch with are just absolutely inundated with information, emails, cold calls. Uh, you know, we all get them ourselves. And so what my team does is we actually take a step back where we know that the door maybe was open for a time. And let's say a demo happened or an appointment or something like that. And then the the contact that we've been talking to just goes dark. Uh, goes dark is a term we use to mean they just suddenly stop answering our phone calls. They stop answering our emails. We don't know what happened to them. And generally, they're not going to be a likely prospect for us. What we do in that scenario is we sort of take the sales rep name out of the game. We don't want anything coming directly from them. Um, we want to take things up a level. And one of the first things we do is we actually do individual research on a key person that we're looking to get in touch with. We figure out what are their interests? Um, what what um, industry events do they go to? Do they speak about a certain topic and they're trying to become a thought leader or something like that? And then we plug in um, a very personalized touch from there. So one example I have is um, a lot of the 
the decision makers uh, that we're trying to get in touch with uh, are fans of, of different sporting events. And we know for us, if we're able to get someone out of the office and get them into a more informal setting, um, it really helps us build relationships. And it also helps us cut down the sales cycle for us, increasing our velocity, sometimes from one year down to 90 days. You get in that room, you build a relationship for a few hours, and before you know it, um, you're able to get that demo again and get the buy-in, get the contract, it's signed, and and you move on to the next. So the, this baseball-specific example is about you know knowing your audience. Um, we actually would know, we would do research and figure out, or we would hear from our sales channel if if a baseball game is something that this person would be interested in, or are they somebody who's more into Broadway shows, or you know something like that. Um, then, as opposed to sending out an email, an email blast saying, "Hey, you know, come join us at the." Um, the White Sox game or the Yankees game or whatever market we're in. Um, instead, we'll send a really nice, high-value, um, custom direct mail piece. Generally, um, something from the the team, um, whether it's a, a printed baseball or you know something that you can find online. And then also, what we would do is we would um, have um, a custom printed jersey that has their name on the back or their firm, the, the account name or, you know, something like that. And we would take a picture of it and send it or, or a map, a mock up usually so that it's, you know, looks a little bit nicer and send that along with the direct mail piece and with a note that says, come meet us out at the baseball game. We'll have this jersey waiting for you. And that gives them, you know, something to look forward to. We try to make it something that's attention getting, something that's personalized. Um, a piece that if an assistant gets is the person who intercepts the the package, um, they're that much more likely to pass it on um, because they know that the the end um, decision maker is would be interested in that. So um, so we'll do something like that. Um, we've got a high um, hit rate and return rate with those kinds of custom pieces versus your standard direct mailer that you're lucky to get 10 sets of eyes on every hundred that you send. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, just, just such a finite number of, uh, of accounts as you are, you really have to go above and beyond. You have to be specific. You have to be deliberate. Um, I love how you mentioned, kind of that additional level of personalization of research you know you you mentioned obviously the the baseball jersey game is a fantastic example but like you said if what it depends on what that person is interested in so you've you know it's not a one size uh, fits all solution exactly we actually did uh, we hosted an event in New York earlier this year and we uh, Thompson Reuters has a, a suite for the Yankees game and we've got some season tickets and we'd offered we'd offered up to the sales channel, do you want to take this person um, to the Yankees game? And they said they, they would never go for that. Can we take them to Hamilton instead? <laughs> <laughs> and we took them to Hamilton instead. Well, that, now that is a huge value add right there. That's right. But when you're talking about um, you know millions of dollars of either retaining or getting a new customer, if that's something we can do that helps build and solidify that the relationship that the sales rep has with them or or the account management team then you know we're we're open to listening to their ideas and and we'll consider it yeah absolutely i mean you know much like you said it's you're you're, you're breaking through a lot of white noise you know there's there are few commodities more valuable these days uh, than someone's time you know to to have that ad, to have that personalization, uh, to really capture someone's attention. I mean, you you had even mentioned I can't, can't remember if it was during the episode if we had talked about it offline. You know, there are there are gatekeepers, and what you're sending is is something that m- is more likely, I suppose, to get through those those gatekeepers. They are more incentivized to pass something like that through. Exactly, and they might even see it and not know that it's from kind of an unknown entity. They might think, oh, this must be from somebody that he or she knows. And so they're that, they are that much more likely to pass it on. And of course, you know, who's going to 
throw something that looks to be of really high value um, in the garbage. You just, you don't want to, I don't think anybody wants to take that risk that maybe they threw something away that that person would have wanted. Yeah. Conceptually, one of the things that you're talking about here is also using direct mail with a call to action. And I know that the the uh, the baseball jersey, baseball game, Hamilton tickets, I mean, these are all, uh, uh, of course, huge, huge examples. I mean, is there a place for using direct mail um, with a call to action on on a smaller scale? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've done, we, we're actually sort of in the exploration phases right now, but across Thomson Reuters, um, account-based marketing is happening in a lot of different places. And one of the, the things that we've done is on more of a, a mass marketing scale, but still very targeted, um, sending out um, something like just one chess piece and someone opens it up and if they have a demo or they have a 15 minute consultation with someone on a sales team, they can get the whole chess board sent to them. Or, you know, there's different unique ideas like that where really what you're doing is you just, you are trying to crack open that door in a unique and compelling way. And it's not something that necessarily has to be um, related specifically to your product or to what you're selling, but it's more something that's an attention grabber and maybe it is something of, of value to the customer or just something unique that they think, oh, hey, yeah, you caught my attention. I'll listen to you for 15 minutes. And then it's the it's up to the, the sales rep to take it from there. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. April, were you talking about this idea of scaling ABM almost, you know, not, not necessarily in, in direct opposition to this scaling ABM sounds difficult because you're ta- you're talking about account based marketing so you're being very specific but you're also scaling at the same time i mean do you find that the, it's difficult to to balance those two aspects um i think it's it's always ongoing you you know when we talk to um our sales channel partners or even other marketing groups that we work with and they'll ask us to do something that is um you know, not not really targeted. And usually I those kinds of things, I have to kick those over the fence to my colleagues who work on things like our demand generation strategies and all of those things that are going out to the masses. However, that's not to say that um, everything we do in account-based marketing doesn't get that really refined, personalized, well-researched touch. Sometimes it's more about um, lumping like accounts together or, um, you know, the way that we do that is we lump together if we know the common objection or the common barrier that we need to overcome, um, we will push out uh, digital marketing campaigns or host events in key markets for several of our accounts together. And then, you know, there we're talking about things like creating thought leadership content or something that's really compelling for that specific group of people that we know why they haven't used our products in the past or we know why they haven't been open to conversations. And then we're getting in the door um, with something that's actually meaningful to them that's not specifically related to our products, but that generally, you know, we, we have that general tie back when you get further down the funnel into the consideration stage where our product also fits into um, whatever it is that the, the problems and the pain points that our accounts are trying to solve. Yeah, this sounds uh, related to something else we've, we've talked about on the show in uh, in making your potential client sort of the the hero of the story it's it's not it's not focused on you and and uh, you know what you can do necessarily it's it's really taking a critical look at at uh, this prospect at this at this account and you know making them the focus of your efforts absolutely and we do that for our key decision makers all the way down to our actual end users where we try to arm them with tips and tricks on how to use our products better, or we've done a lot of targeting around millennials, knowing that um, within our within our target market, our target accounts, um, they're the next uh, the next generation. Of course, you can. I mean, everybody is dealing with that same uh, the same issues where millennials are going to be, you know, the biggest demographic in the workforce and how are they using our products different than someone who's about to retire. And so we've tried to arm our millennials to say, hey, 
here's how you can help use our technology to make your law firm more efficient and better. And that's going to make you look good to the partners and to the key leaders. Um, and so we don't just think about it as a, a C-suite or a law firm partner kind of thought leadership piece. We, we develop things for sort of all levels within the firm. Perfect. Well, uh, and April, you, you clearly have uh, sort of lived up to the hype as an ABM expert. I know you could probably talk about this stuff all day long, um, but if any of our listeners maybe have questions related to today's topic, you know, they're trying to figure out, okay, for us specifically, we, you know, we want to re-engage with these key decision makers or uh, even they want to learn a little bit more about what you've got going on at uh, Thomson Reuters, what's the best way for them to go about contacting you? Sure. Uh, you're right. I could talk about it all day long, and I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to talk with other people who are doing ABM. There's, there. We're out there in pockets, and we're. I think we're just kind of coming into more formal structures. So, um, you can email me. My email is April dot Meyer M E Y E R at tr dot com. You can find me on LinkedIn. The Thomson Reuters website is very simple. It's tr dot com. Easy. April, thanks again so much for your time today. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. If you're a B2B marketer, we want to feature you on sites like the Huffington Post, Social Media Examiner, and Chief Marketer. Every week, we send out a question related to B2B marketing. We use the responses to those questions to fuel the content we write for really popular websites. So head over to sweetfishmedia.com backslash questions and sign up today. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.